reached the top of the hour uh, to formally welcome everyone to today's webinar, Five Tips to Improve Call Centre Performance. I'm Rachel and I'll be your webinar chairperson today. Uh, we've got a jam-packed agenda for you today and delighted to be joined by two brand new speakers for the Call Centre Helpers series. Um, to Anthony Steers, for the Telephone Assassin, um, welcome uh, to the webinar. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be uh, online with you guys and uh, I've uh, followed you guys intently, so it's lovely to get involved. Brilliant. And for people who don't know uh, what the Telephone Assassin is or thinking about your James Bond job, uh, could you <laughs> just share a bit about who uh, you are? So, like I say, it, it, it's certainly not as aggressive as people think uh, when they see the word assassin. Uh, I get put class generally as a sales trainer. Um, however, I tend to try and put myself or I put myself really in the customer service element purely because I don't teach people how to sell. I just show them how to help their customers to buy, which is a slightly different way of thinking about it. Oh, well, well, welcome to the webinar. And uh, to Nelson Giron uh, from Clarabridge, uh, welcome as well to your first webinar. Thank you, thank you. So I also very much look forward to sharing some information and uh, just to let you know what Clarabridge does is um, we focus on data analytics, um, both for customer experience and the contact center. And in my role, I deploy contact center solutions for Clarabridge. Fab, well, thank you for the introduction. Um, just a reminder to everyone that we are taking a recording of today's webinar. The replay and the slides will be available usually about an hour after the webinar on the following link, callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded dash webinars. We're carrying on the discussion as always in our chat room, um, which is callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. You just need to put your first name, last name and email address in. Um, and it does take you through to a separate window, but you can put the two screens side by side so you can carry on listening to the webinar while uh, discussing everything um, with everyone. Um, added bonus of being in the chat room is that you can download a copy of today's sl slides from both our speakers. Lots of information on them, so I would definitely recommend doing that. <laughs> and you can download a copy of the chat log. Uh, bonus number two is that um, as always, we run our um, box of chocolates, a bottle of champagne, or an Amazon gift voucher for the best tip. Um, it's, you just have to write hashtag tip to sh leave your tip in the chat room, or hashtag question to ask the panel a question. So, going to start today's webinar with a poll, which is, on a scale of one to five, how good is your organization at building rapport with customers? Is it five, very good? four good, three average, two poor, or one very poor. So I'm going to just launch this now. Uh, Anthony, what do you think uh, will come out if you're uh, betting I, person? <laughs> um, I think people like to say that they're above average, but I think people don't want to over-egg it. So my guess would be average, but I'm hoping it's good. Uh, I'd like to think people are focusing on it. <laughs> and, and Nelson, would you, would you agree with that? I agree. I think there's going to be a lot of modesty. I think there is there's a lot of passion. There's a lot of caring for what they do. Being in this profession is is it's very you know it's very it's a lot of hard work. And sometimes we could say it's not so good. But I like to think that a lot of people are working very hard to get there. Um, well, I will share the results. So 48% say good, 42% uh, say average, 7% uh, say very good. 3% uh, say poor and zero people said very poor. So, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, um, well done, both of you. I think kind of, yeah, everyone was saying about good, average and above. So now's the time in the agenda where uh, I'm delighted to hand over the baton to Anthony Steers. So let me just pass that over. Here we go. All right. Fantastic. If you could just put that in full screen. Go full screen. Let me start the slideshow. Brilliant. Ah. So, thank you ever so much. So I am uh, Anthony Steers, the telephone assassin, and I've just got a, a few tips that I'm going to share with you today that I'm really hoping is going to uh, make a big difference uh, to the performance in your contact center. As I mentioned, uh, I tend to put myself in that customer service category of, of helping customers to buy rather than looking at aggressive sales tactics. Uh, but I've got three really great tips for you that I'm going to share. Um, however, I just want to share a bit of a philosophy 
um, that I tend to do in my training, which I hope will give a bit of a better picture about my style uh, and the sorts of things that I teach when I'm in my training sessions. Um, I'm going to kick it off by talking about the sort of three simple steps or three phases of a conversation uh, that typically need to happen for you to get the outcome that you want. Uh, so the first one is all around building rapport uh, with people. Obviously, if you can get people to like you, uh, then there's a good chance you can then get them to listen to you. And once they're listening to you, you can move into the second phase of the conversation, which is all around establishing your credibility. And the third stage, once they know that you're credible, is trying to create some form of urgency and an action. You want them to do something as a result of your conversation. Uh, so to go through this in just a little bit more detail, um, to give you an idea, when I talk about building rapport, um, generally good manners is the main, it's the best sales tool I think any salesperson has. Uh, it's totally free, but you tend to find that it's really disarming and can uh, tee off a conversation in a really positive way. Um, and also a little bit of research. We now live in a world where most people share online. Uh, quite a lot about themselves. So you can do a bit of research beforehand and tailor the way that you speak to somebody. Uh, you guys may be wondering what this picture is uh, in front of you at the moment. Uh, for those that have to make outbound phone calls and perhaps maybe even be prospecting, um, I often say to people that uh, if you are prospecting, outbound phone calls typically uh, should feel like you're dropping off a pizza menu. Um, and I'm assuming we all get takeaway menus put through our letterbox on a relatively regular basis. Um, but I often ask the question if you've ever had them knock on your door and ask to take an order, because uh, most of us haven't, because we would find that to be rather rude. Um, and that's the feel that I think people need to get across is that you're just dropping off a pizza menu and not trying to take an order. So the example I always give is when I introduce myself to a potential prospect, I would tell them that I'm the telephone assassin and that I help people increase sales and service on the phone. But I would always say to them, however, I'm assuming you're not looking for training right now because by the most common objection usually is, well, that's great, but we're not looking for that right now. And if you make that OK and make it OK to talk about, you'll find that people will open up and appreciate that you're just dropping off a pizza menu or trying to get on their radar as opposed to trying to sell to them down the telephone. So using really good manners uh, and a little bit of research, rapport is pretty easy to do uh, at the beginning of every call. Once you've done that, um, we then look at establishing um, your credibility. So I always say it doesn't matter if you're a lawyer or a landscaper, the principles work exactly the same. Uh, and the principles or the, the way to perfect your pitch is to share a success story people can relate to. And the important part there is about relating to it. Um, quite often you'll find that a lot of salespeople will typically do what I would call name dropping and they'll mention their biggest client, which makes them feel good, but can often intimidate smaller clients if they don't feel that they're in the same league as the one that you're mentioning. Um, so it's just something that I think everybody should really think about. Um, every business and the way you kind of share these success stories is I think every business should have this sort of library of case studies, uh, these testimonials of what past clients say about you. It makes it much easier and, and most of us cringe when we get to the point where we have to tell people how good we are. Um, if you have these case studies and testimonials, you can let your clients speak for you. Um, but when you build this library, a really useful tip is to put some labels on them so that you know how and when to use them. Uh, at the appropriate time. So uh, most common things that you would label these case studies with might be around the industry of the client. If you do a lot of work in a particular industry or field, uh, it's good to be able to demonstrate to other people in that field that you are the go-to people for that industry for your type of product or service. And that can be really helpful. Um, another great label to put on there would actually be the job title of the person that you speak to. Uh, because that may change the language that people are used to and how well they'll relate to what's being said. So, for example, because I do quite a lot of training, uh, sometimes I'll talk to a sales manager, sometimes it may be a HR manager or an L&D director. So I'll always be conscious that if I'm talking to a HR manager, I'd like to share what another HR manager says about me, even if they're in different industries 
purely because they'll use similar type of language and have similar values which the other person can then relate to, uh, which can be really useful. Um, you can also label uh, with regards to what the objection might be. Some of us have quite common objections or have an opportunity to upserve a client and actually they might inquire about one particular product and you really think that there's another product that may be slightly higher in cost that you would like to encourage them to look at. This can be a great way of, uh, of upserving your clients by showing them what that product or service can do for that particular client. So other ways to label them might be by the product or service that you guys have offered that client in the past. So for example, I do a bit of coaching, I do a bit of training, and I do speaking. So they're three labels that I would put onto my case studies so that I know depending on what they're interested in, I know the right sorts of case studies that I can share with them. But this can be particularly effective with the inbound calls and like I say, allow you to what I would call upserve clients and recommend perhaps a more appropriate product or service. So as I said, perfecting your pitch is about sharing success stories people can relate to. Your third and final stage, so you've built rapport and you've established your credibility. The next stage is around creating urgency. So I often say, and I deliberately use the language, that everybody really uh, should offer at least a test drive or a variety of test drives. And the car industry are particularly good at this. Obviously, we, we um, associate a test drive as being with a car. Uh, but I've worked with manufacturers and garages before. And although the sales guys get paid commission for selling cars and selling finance, most of them are actually targeted on booking test drives. And that's purely because you are 78% more likely to buy a car once you've driven it. So I try and apply that same philosophy uh, to all the businesses that I work with and try and figure out what types of test drive could you offer people that would demonstrate the value that you can bring to them and actually get them to sort of buy into the value and to you as a business and the, the quality and value of your product. So for some businesses, you have a variety of different test drives and the lowest form I would, I would say is probably like a tip sheet. Um, might be the, the five do's and don'ts if you're going to go it alone. Um, so that can be really useful. Uh, often I would use that in a business expo type of situation where I'm trying to capitalize on footfall. Uh, but it can be a great way of giving somebody some value. And when you're sending case studies uh, over to people, adding a tip sheet can be a nice extra touch to give them some extra value uh, for what you're sending them. Uh, for those out there that would look to set up a meeting with a potential client, either inviting them to come and see you or going to see them, so I would call that a discovery meeting. That could be a great form of a test drive. Um, but for other businesses, you might offer a, a demo, for example. If you do software or you've got certain products, you might end up showing them a demo uh, or allowing them to try out one of the products. Um, these can be really good ways of getting people to engage with the product so that they can fully understand it and see the value before you get to the point where you want to try and close them and get them to make a decision. So offering a test drive, I think, is a really useful uh, thing to do uh, because it just helps people to uh, experience the value that you can offer, but without asking them to sign on the dotted line and give you lots of money. And like you can see from the statistics, if they're 78% more likely to buy once they've had a test drive, it seems like a logical good step to take people through. So they're the three steps uh, or the three phases of, of the conversation that I would teach and I talk about when I uh, sort of keynote and do the large conferences. It's all about building rapport, establishing your credibility and creating urgency. So that's the philosophy of what I tend to talk about. But now I want to get down to the nitty gritty of the, the tips really that are going to make a difference to the performance in the contact center itself. So the first tip I always give, and for some companies we make it best practice, for others they may have a, a, call, a company call standard. But the best thing I always say, if you're going to make any outbound phone calls, it's always good to make sure that you get permission to speak at the beginning of the call. And many of us may do that in our own way already. So we might ask, I might say, hey, Rachel, are you free to chat for a minute or are you OK to talk? Um, but I have a very set way that I tend to do it, which is a, a nice, polite greeting that assumes that perhaps now isn't a good time. 
So um, if I was phoning Rachel, I'd be saying, oh, good afternoon, Rachel. My name is Anthony Steers, and I was just hoping to chat to you for a couple of minutes, but I'm assuming perhaps now isn't the best time. So I wondered if there's a better time to call you back. The beauty of doing this is it's so polite and it makes it so easy for them to get out of the call that they instantly start thinking you can't possibly be in sales. Or if you are in sales, that perhaps you're just not very good at it and therefore you're not to be feared. So I always say if you start your calls by getting permission to speak, you'll typically find um, that you won't really have any bad calls because you're not barging in on somebody's day and ambushing them into a conversation that they're not ready to have. And I think we've all phoned somebody before who is either having a bit of a bad day or you can tell is distracted and doing something else. So I'd say from a statistics perspective, um, if you were prospecting, for example, and you weren't having a particularly lucky day, if you made 10 phone calls, seven of them would probably go to voicemail or somebody would try and take a message and I would just say, look, don't worry, I'll call back another time. But of the three people that answer, uh, two may turn around and say, actually, you're right, I'm about to go into a meeting or I'm just finishing off a tender. Could you give me a call back at three o'clock or could you give me a call on Friday? and they'll automatically go back into your pipeline as a callback. Um, you may even ask somebody uh, when they say that if, if, they would like you to send, if, if they would like you to send them a calendar invite, because that just suggests that you're putting it in your diary and you're going to stick to the time that you've agreed. Uh, so this can be a great way uh, of, like I say, making sure you start the call and you know that they are ready to speak, because at least one in three people, when you use that technique, will say, well, go on then, I've got two minutes now, what is the call about? And the beauty of that is you've actually managed to create curiosity into what the call is about, as opposed to um, just trying to impress them with what you want to talk about. So it becomes less of a pitch and more of a conversation. So always get permission to speak at the beginning of your calls, particularly if you're making outbound calls. Um, the second tip is at the end of every call, the best way to prevent what I would call pipeline constipation is to make sure that you always take final responsibility for the next time you're going to speak to people. This just makes sure that you're constantly teeing up when the next call or conversation is going to be so that they don't forget about you or more importantly, so you don't forget about them. So this, is, uh, this can be used if you were dropping off a pizza menu to a new prospect who says, yes, I'm happy to have a look at your, uh, your case studies of similar clients, um, and you know that they're semi-interested but perhaps don't have an imminent need. I would ask people if, if they would get chance to look at what I'm going to send them in the next week or two, because I believe that's a nice reasonable time frame to give somebody to look at the information. Over 80% of people, when you ask that question, will just agree and say, yes, I'm sure I will. So I can then follow that up with fantastic. Well, I'll leave the ball in your court, like I'm going to leave the ball in their court and say, I'll leave the ball in your court. And if you have any questions or concerns or need to come back to me, please feel free to, to come back to me. However, I will make a note in two weeks time that if we haven't spoken, I'll give you just a quick courtesy call just to make sure it got through your spam filter. And I can just highlight why I picked out the things that I sent across for you because one may be a case study of somebody in their industry, and the other one may be from somebody who has the same job title as them, and you can highlight why you've ch chosen to pick those out for, for them. Uh, tip two and a half, uh, if you wanted to continue to use this taking final responsibility when you're leaving voicemails, this can be particularly effective. So if I was to phone Rachel up and she didn't answer, I'd be saying, hey, Rachel, it's Anthony Steers here. I wondered if you could give me a call back on this number, and I would say my number. However, I'll make a quick note that if I haven't heard back from you by Friday, I'll give you a call when I'm back in the office on Friday afternoon. This is a lovely way to make sure that people know you are going to persist and keep following them up. They unfortunately uh, can't be angry with you now for following them up on Friday and, and chasing them because if they didn't want you to phone them on Friday, then they need to respond to your message. So it's a great way, whether you're in conversation or leaving a message, to just stay in control of the next step of your process uh, so that you can move people through your pipeline. So there's your first two tips. Always get permission to speak at the beginning of the call and always take final responsibility for the next time you're going to speak to somebody. 
The third and final tip from me is about reducing call times. I know in contact centers, and we've talked about it already, that we don't really have enough time in the day. And sometimes we have clients who really do like to chat to us and keep us talking. Um, so what I do with a lot of clients is teach them about a pre-frame. If you know you have a particular client that likes to chat quite a lot, when you receive that inbound call from them and you get you recognize their voice or they tell you who they are, you can say to them, hey, Rachel, lovely to hear from you. Just to let you know, I've got a, a call scheduled for 10 minutes time. Is this a quick one or if it's a longer one, am I OK to call you back? And it's just a nice way to make sure that you keep your calls nice and short um, so that you can get more calls squeezed into one day and stops you having what I would call more fluffy conversations with clients who just want to chat. So that's the tips from me. Uh, I always talk about uh, doing wish list marketing rather than database marketing, but I will stick to the phrase that sales is a numbers game. However, I don't think it's about objection handling and convincing people to buy. It's more about capitalizing on the conversations that people are ready to have, because that's really what it's about. It's engaging people in a conversation rather than just delivering a pitch. So I hope you found some of these tips really useful. I'm going to uh, hand you back over to Rachel now. And obviously, I'd love to hear any questions that people have. Uh, and be curious to know when you put this into practice, uh, what results you found. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Anthony. A lot of information there and some some really useful things. Uh, you know, I know that we talked in the, the dress rehearsal uh, that Nelson and I kind of taking some of those away to, <laughs> for, for our lives as well. So uh, let's go over to the uh, chat room and see what's been happening, because I know there's there's lots of things flying through. Um, so Jose said, uh, agents should flex their communication styles with the callers. As an example, if the agent has an expressive caller, the agent could try and use an informal tone and then focus on the big picture. Anthony, what are your thoughts on that one? Absolutely. Um, I, th I think that first line kind of summarizes it. I always say to people that I teach a philosophy and a process or an emo the emotional steps you want to take people through. But once that's sunk in, I end up coaching a lot of clients that I work with to help them to develop their own style um, and although people like some of the phrases and things that I say I always just say to them you need to find your own language that you're comfortable with that doesn't feel like you're using somebody else's words or reading a script um, but yeah absolutely right uh, if you're talking to somebody who's quite expressive you you, you kind of want to match it um, and you can you usually get a good sense and this is what I said earlier on about if you really tune in and listen, usually the right thing to say next will automatically pop into your head. And that's why the flex of your communication is so crucial. Otherwise, it just feels rigid and scripted. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Matt said, uh, ensure your agent's objectives align with the business objectives and that these are continually revisited. Uh, so Sven sent in a question saying, how would you transfer the idea of offering a test drive when you don't offer products but services? Do you see a way to use this technique anyway? Anthony, I think this is uh, back to your uh, Ab test drive. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, technically, I offer services. So for me, uh, a test drive that I would offer somebody who is looking at training, for example, is I would ask if we could, if I, if they would get their team together, and I would ask if we could do a video call for 45 minutes, um, and I would offer to give them some tips to help them either improve a very specific KPI or to how to get round a particular objection if it comes up, or even how to stop that objection coming up in the first place. So the agreement I would have with somebody is, well, it sounds like you're interested in in training, but you're not 100% convinced at the moment. Let's get your team onto a call. Uh, they can tell me what their biggest challenges are. I'll give them a few tips, um, but the condition is, I will do this as a free test drive. However, I do need to send you an invoice. Um, however, as long as you give me written feedback 14 days after our call to tell me what's happened as a result of implementing my advice, then you don't need to pay my invoice. And it's a lovely way of doing what I would call a value swap with somebody. They get value from it, I get value from it. And I'm 
pretty confident that my advice works. So usually I get two outcomes that would happen after that kind of a test drive. I'll either fix their one and only problem and they'll write me a glowing testimonial to say how great it is. And they won't say, Anthony did a free call and we took this advice away. They'll say, after spending 45 minutes on the phone with Anthony, our call center are, are now increased their conversion ratio by X or have found that this is a result. Um, so I get a great bit of feedback, which is another success story I could go and share, even though it's not from a paying client. But a bit like the test drive, quite often it just whets people's appetite and they go, wow, that really worked. And by getting them to write down the outcome and the results, I think that helps to cement it in their mind about the value. And like I say, it whets their appetite for saying, what else could you help us with? So I think it's a nice way of, of, of almost giving a bit of free advice, but doing it in a way that says, well, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. And uh, that always goes down really well. Yeah, and, and Laura's written uh, in the chat room, is it something that you could offer a free 30-day trial of services? Because I know a lot of people That's kind of offer absolutely. those. Um, at Clarabridge, I, I mentioned uh, you're going to get an opportunity to do a demo, but once, you've, once you see how great it is, um, I'm sure you'll be able to do a trial, and it's definitely something that you can do. Um, it's a great way of just getting people to use it. I think doing a demo before you do a trial is probably quite important because if you give somebody a trial for something that they don't know how it works they probably won't get the most value or be able to use all the functionality um, but it's a great thing to do but if you're going to do it I would always say to them we'll help you get it set up we'll talk to you after two weeks to see how you're getting on and we'd actually like to interview you for 10 or 15 minutes after four weeks to find out what difference is actually made from you and I think it's a nice way of doing that value swap and, and allowing people to get used to it. And from a software perspective, it's a good way of getting some of their data into the system so that they can start analyzing some of the trends and insight that can then allow them to change their tax slightly and improve their performance. So absolutely. Yeah. And Nelson, I know that you're going to show us a, a few glimpses of the uh, Clara Bridge software um, later so that people can kind of uh, ask for a demo afterwards. That would be great. Um, so uh, we've had a tip in from Laura who said, uh, just be understanding. If you have a customer who's upset or angry and they're expressing these feelings to you, let them. They're not going to be able to listen until, you re they, until they remove the emotion. You can say, I understand why you're upset, and I would be too. I'm happy to get you straightened out. Um, so, oh, sorry. Was that I'm just going to say that's an oh, absolutely no. br brilliant tip. I do a lot of stuff with complaints departments, and I always say, let people get to the end of their rant uh, and basically get it off their chest, because usually, once they've finished, they will then apologize. Um, they'll have a shout and tell you how you've ruined their life or their morning or whatever and then go and I'm really sorry because I know it wasn't you who did this um, <laughs> that's the point where they've got it off their chest and they're then ready to listen so I think Laura that's an absolutely great tip yeah and, and Nelson I'm sure you would agree on that one absolutely I think that um, one of the things that we see and evaluate is that not everyone is expressive and they're letting you know their emotions whenever you have someone telling you that they're upset or frustrated, it's extremely valuable because you could probably assume that other people are feeling the same way and they can get you to those friction points to better understand if, of course, you're going to let your customer express their emotions, but also what is, what is it something that we need to fix within our own processes to make sure that we can avoid this frustration or confusion? Um, so we've got one final tip before we carry on from Beth who says ask the team to come to you with any barriers to building rapport if something is not going to be done about it make sure the team know why so if the customer takes notice of that broken process the advisor can explain it to the customer to ensure that it doesn't damage the relationship with the company um, so We'll be coming back to your tips later. Just keep sending them in. Um, so before we hand over to Nelson, I, we've got another poll, which is what have you tried to do to improve agent efficiency? So it's a select all that apply. Um, have you adapted your quality scorecards? Analyze voice and post call surveys together? Listen to calls to find and share best practice? Benchmarked your agents? Or have you done something else? And in which case, um, if you could leave it in the chat room. So I will just launch this one now. Um, so Nelson, what do you think, or what are you hoping to see? 
Um, I'm hoping to see, um, looking, uh, likely listen to calls to find and share best practice. Yeah. Okay, so uh, last few votes just coming in. Um, slight change at the, well, near the top. Uh, so I will share the results. So 85% say listen to calls to find and share best practice. 36% uh, say benchmarked your agents. 33% say adapted your quality scorecards. 27% say analyze voice and post call surveys together. And 11% have said other. And we'll um, see if there's things in the chat room. And um, Nelson, is, is that kind of the outcome you were expecting to see? I, I was, yes. A lot of <laughs> yeah. Fab. Uh, well, we'll come back to um, see what's uh, been in the chat room, but I think it's the perfect opportunity to hand over to you now and uh, for your presentation. Brilliant. Thank you. Fab. Um, okay. Can you see my screen? We can. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much for partaking of this webinar. Um, I am going to focus on um, the technical piece. I think Anthony has done a fantastic job focusing on the pieces that are part of the human element. Um, I, and, and I would like to show you how you could potentially focus on that a little bit more. So um, tip four will be improve agent efficiency and tip five will be enhance your customer experience. So before I do that, let me set quickly the stage to talk about machines and humans. And they're both complementary systems. You know, machines are good at the things that humans are bad at, and humans are good at the things that machines um, are bad at. And, and I, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if you saw the little video, there's a little robot doing gymnastics, so they're getting pretty close. But for the time being, um, you know, they're good, they're things that we're very good at. So for example, machines are good at dealing with large quantities of data, uh, doing a lot of calculations very quickly, and making sure that they can do unbiased responses. Whereas humans, we are very good at abstract thinking. We are very good at recognizing emotions and also changing very quickly to adapt to our own environment. So going back to the contact center, humans pretty much do everything today. And I know there are some technology tools, but at the end of the day, we are the ones doing the heavy lifting. So I have listed a couple of things that automation has helped to improve the quality and how the humans are interacting with the contact center. And I will focus on the top three since our tips are around that, but you can see that there are some possibilities of maybe simplifying post-call documentation, looking at root cause and complaints research, and also evaluating compliance and risk monitoring. So let me quickly jump into our tip four. So tip four is improving agent efficiency by coaching your teams a little faster. So technology is allowing us today to analyze 100% of our interactions. Um, and also it's allowing us that flexibility, not just to look at certain sources, just to bring them all together so we can analyze them. Um, from a voice, I actually saw one of these tips um, where you can bring the voice transcriptions and tie them to post-call surveys together so that you can do summarize KPIs and make sure that you understand how you're doing as far as um, agent performance or overall customer satisfaction. What's, what's really cool about this tip is that technology is allowing us to create weight scorecards. So we can apply conditional logic and create or mimic the scoring that you currently have today because we can capture using natural language processing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence to ensure that we can start kind of piecing together what people are saying, what we expect them to say, especially for outbound calls, if we have a requirement of someone that they need to identify themselves in a certain way. So following these little scripts to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to, and in turn, measure soft skills and as well as specific rules for business rules. So this has been very val valuable because we want our agents to be cordial. We want them to greet, identify themselves. And we can also, by the way that they're transferring calls or placing customers on hold and even reaching out to ensure that they are doing a good job and curating these calls for listening. So um, a very neat thing that, that can be done by applying and using these automations and these scorecards is that you don't have to listen to absolutely everything. 
you can create reports that can tell you there these are the calls that missed the following items so that you can go and attack those and spend more time coaching and really um, the other thing that you could do as a result of these scorecards is benchmarking your agents making sure that you don't always look for the bad behaviors but you are also rewarding the positive behaviors so now let me show you real quick what a potential scorecard may look like so we can create different taxonomies. This is really flexible. It really depends on the requirements that you have, whether they are for inbound or outbound calls. But in this example, we, we are looking at a category called soft skills. Are they greeting the customer in a friend, with a friendly hello? Are they mentioning the name of the company that they're calling from? Or are they displaying empathy? Meaning that, uh, as an example that was shown, is that you're gonna let the person express their emotions and then reply back saying, yes, I understand that you are upset about this. Um, and also we can look at specific business rules. So for this example, we have compliance where if we are taking a call where we need to process a payment and we need to ensure that we are letting our customer know that there is a fee associated with that, making sure that we are saying those things so that from a regulatory perspective, we're not getting in trouble, but at the same time, just making sure that we are following the steps. And it's not always limited to compliance. There could be other potential business rules that can be set up based on what the agent is saying. So this is a way of saying, you know, let me build the scorecard in an application and make sure that I can put all my call transcriptions to be evaluated. And what is, so how does, how can we use this? How does, what does this look like? So this is a sample report of what you could potentially have. Um, we can have our compliance score. We could look at it on a daily basis. Same thing with a soft skills course. So this may not mean a lot to, to us, but if this is a benchmark or this is a scorecard that we're working on and we know that we want a particular team, agents, groups to be at a certain level, we can trend it over time. So if we are coaching our agents, we can potentially see and quantify if our coaching efforts are being successful or not, or even do the comparisons between teams. But most importantly, and I, and I wanna emphasize this, but it's, it's not just about finding incorrect behaviors, but also by rewarding the ones that are doing well and replicating what they're doing well. So in turn, what we wanna do is we wanna spend less time on uh, doing manual scoring listening to calls to find all these coachable moments and have you spend time coaching, calibrating, benchmarking, and overall improving. So the data is really powerful. And of course, we're not trying to remove the human from the process. It's just an aid to ensure that we are not sampling calls, that we're not trying to find out, um, you know, listen to 50 calls before I get to a coachable moment. Now, let me take you to tip five. And this is one of my favorites. So improve customer experience by measuring and identifying effort, sentiment, and emotions. So these three things are really powerful that we can detect from every single conversation or, or interaction within the contact center. Then we can overlay these over our call drivers to better understand how our customers feel, what is the emotion that that particular interaction triggered, and what is the sentiment around it, whether the experience was positive or negative. Uh, this, I think this, is, this next uh, line is, is really important as well um, for outbound contact centers where, um, or I'm sorry, inbound, where we have interactions with our customers where we ask them, we send them surveys, how easy was it to resolve this issue or how easy was it to work with us? You are dependent on a survey response. Uh, with technology, we can tell you, we can measure effort on every interaction. So you expand the sample. And again, going back to my mention of being able to look with technology at 100% of your data so that you can make better and more informed solutions. Um, this, all, this next one is also very important as well. And this is closing the loop with your customers. So um, for you to be reactive, you usually await a post-call survey as an example. And you sometimes may reach out to the customer to figure out why they gave you a low score. Some customers could be really upset that they just toss away that survey. And this is an opportunity for you to understand and maybe see if they are being upset or if they say process or if, they, if you can close the loop and let them know and make sure that you're trying to continue to build that loyalty so they feel good about dealing with you and working with your company. And last is really finding those moments of truth and peak emotions before listening to a call. These things can be surfaced before you, like I mentioned before, is you don't have to listen to uh, a ton of calls before understanding what is it that is driving a negative experience to a particular call. These can be brought out, benchmarked, and scored. So now let me take you to a quick example of you know, what calls drive high customer effort. So we can take a look at the data 
overall. And in, in a very simple visualization, we can filter and we can analyze and say, okay, I want you, I want to filter all the calls that contain a high level of frustration. So we're looking at emotions. Then we want to also look at conversations where there is a high level of effort when customers are telling you it was really hard or uh, I've been trying for the longest time to accomplish X, Y, and Z task. And we can use sentiment to color the bar. So we are looking for calls that have low sentiment that we are right now showing you as red. So very powerful. And these things can be surfaced to you so that now you can click and preview some of these calls and get a better understanding of like, here are the ones based on your call driver that you need to pay attention to or better understand to see what is going on. And I think there's an application also for outbound calls where you could start evaluating what are some of the reasons your calls are being rejected or what are customers saying so that you again can position yourself to better understand the emotions, the amount of effort, or really the sentiment of that particular experience. So let me take you through um, why do we talk about sentiment and effort together um, as being indicators or you know, why does this produce loyalty? So NPS is a very trusted score. Um, I think it, some of you are familiar with it, but uh, you can also use loyalty index. And really what the, it's, it's like I said, it's a very good validation of what's taking place, but sometimes these experiences have already taken place. And if you want to make a change to improve it, it takes a while for you to validate that change. But by examining the text and these interactions from the contact center, we can now overlay sentiment. And we can apply sentiment to every single conversation, whether it is chat, email, or a phone call transcript that can lead us to those moments of truth. Then we can go ahead and derive emotions. We wanna identify pain points. We wanna understand where customers are telling you that hey, this really frustrated me, or uh, I feel really upset. Again, letting them unload those emotions because they don't happen all the time. Some people may not, may be so upset they didn't even tell you what's going on and they just hang up on you. And last is effort. Being able to find those friction points that are causing high confusion. And one of our favorite examples is if you are in a support contact center and you have someone that has been trying to accomplish a task on a website, as an example, process a payment, and then they have to call, then they can tell you, look, I try to use your website and it was really difficult, what's going on? And these are the things that you could understand to maybe minimize channel hopping and fix issues or maybe send feedback to a product team to ensure that you can continue to be as efficient and address the concerns that are affecting your customers. And I'll leave you with this last piece is, just wanted to give you a quick example of how all these work together, effort, emotion, sentiment, and your loyalty KPI or MPS. So we can use emotion and effort to find those high friction points that are causing a lot of confusion. Then we can use sentiment and satisfaction to allow us to understand the impact. Also very importantly, to help us prioritize what is something that we need to look at first. Then we can develop the solution, focus on minimizing the level of effort, or maybe turning around that emotion. If we have people calling to let us know that they're upset about dealing with a process, you know, let's figure out how we reduce that upsetness to make sure that when they call or maybe reduce phone calls overall. And last, we can again use sentiment and that satisfaction score to help us track those results and changes, help us validate so that we can um, make sure that our solutions or what we're trying to do as a contact center together to reduce potential calls or improve your scores is working. And I just bringing it back to, to the automation humans, we, we do believe that automation can be helpful, but our goal is not to solely have machines do everything for us. I think they can help us do the things that keeps us busy. And overall, I think what's important is to augment that human role to allow us to do human things. We still need humans and humans are the ones that continue to focus on coaching, being empathetic, listening, and overall really making sure that as a contact center and as a company, they are successful. So that concludes my presentation and I wanted to thank you and I will hand it back to you, Rachel, and look forward to seeing any questions. Fab, well, a lot of information there. Um, for everyone who, um, you know, we're gonna ask, oh, okay, we've put the poll up and asking, would you like to see a demonstration of the Clarabridge solution? 
Uh, Nelson, I especially enjoyed the kind of how technology can take away, you know, so you spend less time on kind of scoring and right. more time on coaching and the actual human side of, of things. Um, and also showing, you know, how sentiment can be, you know, identified in things through the, the Clara Bridge solution. Um, I like the uh, I liked the food, but the waiter was rude and being able to kind of split the kind of two bits of it. Um, I'm so... all in the chat room, but I also want to join the demo because it's the first <laughs> technology for, for contact centres that isn't just trying to automate everything. You're actually trying to give valuable insight to the leaders so that they can coach. And I just think that's so valuable <laughs> to every contact centre. So add my name to that list, please, Rachel. Fair, but I will do. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so going over to the uh, the chat room, um, lots going on, so I will get right to it. So uh, Loretta said, we usually do a follow up email when we leave voicemails right after the voice message. Uh, so I believe, um, was it you, Anthony, who talked about kind of the follow ups on um, kind of when you leave voice messages and things? Yeah, so uh, I, I've got no issues in, in doing an email after you've done a voicemail message. I always say emails should be there to create a paper trail of the conversations that and messages that have actually happened rather than trying to interact via email. Um, but yeah, a quick email to somebody to say, hey, I've just left you a voicemail. Figure I'd email you just in case it comes through quicker. Let me know when you're around. It just gives that multiple channels. Um, and if their preference leans towards an email response is quicker, then it gets you your response quicker. Fab. Uh, so Dennis said, uh, if you are going to offer a free trial or offer a trial, ensure that you identify a few features that really resonate with the client so it can be more pertinent to them. So we've had a question in from Lisa who said, what tips do you have for getting the rest of the organisation invested in using emotion as a metric? Um, Nelson, I don't know if you want to take this one. Sure, I'll take it. Um, I think that when you look at customer experience as ubiquitous from just the contact center and how it can be helpful, not just to improving processes, but also improving the business overall. Um, in my example that I mentioned about channel hopping, if you have someone using your website and they're frustrated, they're telling you that in the contact center. And you could go with that information and saying, look, you this bank process is causing a lot of frustration. Let's fix it. And it's more of the contact center is such an untapped source of feedback that it is really powerful and other teams should be listening. And I think that's how you can get through and making sure that other people understand and listen to emotion, effort, and what sentiment can bring. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Melina's uh, sent in a tip. She says that uh, use the STAR method when handling customer issues. So sorry, apologize for the error slash inconvenience. Thank the customer for bringing the issue to your attention action take action to correct the issue slash concern and recover recover the client by restoring their confidence in you or the company uh anthony i don't know whether you've ever seen this one before i have to say it's not one that i've seen before but i love it i, I always say to people great customer service isn't a guarantee things won't go wrong it's a promise that if it does we'll fix it and i think that's a really polite empathetic way I love the thanking customers. I think like you said, Nelson, if people are telling you that there's a problem, you should be grateful because it then gives you the ability to try. And in restaurants, I never used to complain. I would just think I would never go back. But my wife always says, well, if you don't tell them what the problem is, how are they supposed to fix it? So Absolutely. that bar technique, I think, is, is a great tip. I think somebody's in the running for the champagne. And I wanted <laughs> to, to add on to this one. Um, in, in our industry experience, what we have seen is that when customers tell us that there is something wrong, it is the opportunity, it's a great opportunity to shine and really show what you can do because those that, are, that the ones that are telling you there are problems, that's the audience that you can do best and make sure that you turn them into the promoters. Um, you, you see it in the hotel industry. The ones that gave you the highest rates are the ones that had issues because you turn around and fixed it. Yeah. And on that note, I, I did a huge conference for a client I've done work for for the last few years. And um, I, as halfway through the session, I get them to make easy calls first. I get them to phone up and ask for testimonials. And so many of them were shocked about how the best testimonials came from clients who had issues that they then resolved. 
and actually they make for the, almost the best testimonials was we had this issue but they fixed it and this was the outcome and you think actually I think that's great rather than just saying they're amazing I'd highly recommend them um, yeah. yeah I think uh, absolutely it's brilliant brilliant advice and so Jose said proactively provide further information to related concerns in a natural way to avoid the need for the customer to call back uh, Nelson what are your thoughts on that one um so let me let me take it in um, <laughs> um <laughs> throw it out on you no 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 thank you no i think it's um i think this one has to do with with being proactive and making sure that you are tackling the issue head on and making sure that you don't have a return and call so i i'm in complete agreement i think that when you take on a call, you want to ensure that you let them know what's happening so that if anything changes, if there's a change of expectations that they're aware so that we don't have a callback or I think I think it's great. I don't know, Anthony, what do you, what do you think about this? Yeah, I suppose it, it almost comes back to that library of testimonials. If, if it's issues that come up um, every now and again that can't necessarily be fixed, um, you can share other people have had that issue, but this is how we've managed to fix it in the past. It just kind of, I think, says we are aware of it and we're not ignoring it. I think there's an acknowledgement of the issue, um, but to share the fact that they're not the only one having that issue and that there is a resolution, I think, is a, a great way of keeping customers on side. Uh, like I say, it, it's you're not guaranteeing things aren't going to go wrong. It's just that promise that we'll fix it if it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so Laura sent in a tip saying have a direct channel of communication between the support center and product managers to address common issues so that you're constantly staying on top of things. Uh, Lisa's got a question saying should we be defining which specific emotions we want to measure? Uh, Nelson, <laughs> hopefully an easy um, one. <laughs> well, I I think if you think of your interactions, um, I think the more specific emotions, depending on if, if it's an inbound call or an outbound call, if it's an inbound call, you're looking for anger, frustration, and confusion. Um, if you're looking for an outbound call, then you wanna look for different emotions, maybe a little surprise or maybe anger, and to see how these are represented in each of these interactions. But I think it's, you wanna go after the, the things that make people uncomfortable and want them, you know, make them sort of give you, let you know that they're not happy with something that you're doing with them or the company overall. Yeah. Uh, so Dennis has said, uh, when making a pitch to integrate technology, expect upper management to look for cost reduction. To counter this, though, offer enhanced ca capacity and not extra costs. So more sales, better achievements of standard service, et cetera. Uh, so Dorcas has said, uh, our agents are humans, let's treat and see them as such establish flexible and re realistic oh realistic scoring models uh, so nelson i think that's exactly what you were saying at the beginning absolutely absolutely is is that human factor and, and like i said it's not just rewarding the negative behaviors it's also looking who's doing a good job it's really difficult sometimes to be on the other side of the phone and you're doing your job and you have to deal with someone who's angry eight hours a day so <laughs> it takes a toll on us but it's important to know that they are the ones listening and, and really providing these expectations and making sure that we can get there a lot sooner to identify problems or if this is more widespread. Yeah. Uh, so Martin said any trial or test drive must have clear agreed success criteria that both parties sign up to, including next steps. Uh, yep, yeah, Anthony, this is this is yeah, going back to your point. It's that value swap thing, but, um, but a bit like I said with the demo before the trial, if they don't know which features and functionality are going to be most useful and appropriate for them, you're not giving them the best chance of experiencing the value without doing a bit of research first and tailoring that experience to impact the KPI that they're particularly wanting to improve. Yeah. Uh, so we've had a, an opinion in um, saying, should we always ask permission to speak? I find this creates an opportunity for the customer to ask what the call is about. What should we do? Uh, yeah, Anthony, I think this is another one for you. Um, so it does create the opportunity to ask them what it's about, but that is a sign that they're ready to listen and that they're curious to find out what it's about. The other option is to just rattle off a pitch and see if they hang up on you. 
I suppose. Um, yeah, I, I always get permission to speak at the beginning. And in fact, I'm working with an insurance company that I've been doing a lot of stuff with recently, and they get a lot of inbound calls um, for people who want to quote. Um, so they have to check, have you got 10 minutes because I need to run through a medical questionnaire and there's some things that I need to go through with you. Because if people phone in and think it's going to take five minutes and it's not, you don't want to get seven minutes in and then realize that they need to go. Uh, what you want to do is pre-frame, figure out exactly, make sure you're, you're managing people's expectations before you move forwards. Um, yep. So inbound and outbound, permission to speak, I think is just a, a courteous way of starting the call, making sure both people are ready to listen. So yeah, I'd, I'd definitely say it needs to be done. Yeah. And so Jose sent in a, another tip saying, appeal to the caller's interest in communication style. You'll con continue your role as an advocate and follow their lead. Um, Nelson, I don't know what your thoughts are on that one. Um, I think this is about building rapport. I think this is about connecting with the caller and making sure that they understand that you're working hard for them and that you are uh, working on their best interests. I think that that is a great tip. I think it, it unarms people that are upset or that they are not happy with you when they have to call you. Yes. Yeah. Um, so Barry sent in a tip saying, set clear expectations as to what is expected from advisors. We should never assume. We need to ensure that our expectations are clearly explained and that we are continually checking and understanding in coaching sessions. Um, so Jose, obviously after the champagne, says uh, by being an advocate for, your cus for the customer, you help the customer feel like you are on their side and will help them resolve their issue. Um, yep, yeah, Nelson, I think this is uh, kind of what you were saying about um, resolving their issues. Mm -hmm. And I, on that note, I say to a lot of account managers oh. who feel that they can't, they don't want to be salesy, is you should feel like you're sat on your client's side of the table, helping them get the best out of your company because you know your company better than they do. Your job is to help them to buy as opposed to sell to them. And I think that's a really good way of putting it. It's uh, like you say, you'd be an advocate for the customer. Um, yeah. And, and your, your job is to help them buy something that they're not used to buying typically. Yeah. Um, so, uh, no, ah, Jose has also said, uh, sharing our own experiences help build rapport with our clients. And Dennis has said, when making a pitch to integrate technology, Oh, I think we've actually had this one. Expect upper management to look for cost reduction. I think we've come to that one, actually. Um, so actually, we've reached uh, the end of the webinar. So I'd just like to uh, say in one or two words, could you write in the chat room? What did you like best about the webinar? And today's uh, winning tip. Yeah, well done. Comes in from Jose saying, acknowledge the baggage. Show the customer you understand their entire relationship with the company by acknowledging their past interactions and issues. This baggage influences the customer's perception of their current interaction. Uh, just a reminder, we have a survey uh, that comes up immediately following the webinar, so we'd be really grateful if you could fill it in. Uh, just a reminder that the replay will be available later on this afternoon on uh, the following link. And we will be back next week with seven ways to build customer relationships. And I'd just like to thank our two speakers, to Anthony Steers, the telephone assassin. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for interrupting your holiday as well. <laughs> We're always working, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and to Nelson Giron from Clara Bridge, thank you very much for, for your great technology insight. Thank you. Fab. And uh, I will be back next week. Thank you all. Goodbye.